this video, we'll be looking at phenotypic ratios of inheritance of two genes. Uh, the way that we're going to tackle this is actually thinking about it in terms of exam questions. Now, in questions often um, about this general topic, we'll be asking you to, for example, do um, a Punnett square to predict what the genotypic and phenotypic ratios might be. And then uh, another type of question would be saying, okay, you've predicted what the expected ratios might be, but then the observed one would be different. Then it's about how do you find out if there is significant difference between them and then try to explain for that unexpected uh, ratio. So that's how we're going to tackle it. Is to first of all think about if we come across a, a question that asks about uh, phenotypic ratios, is how do we actually interpret it? So first of all, we're going to split them into two parts. Right, one part will be about okay if we have got the expected ratio, or the question asks you to um, to to predict it. What would the answers uh, that you should? What will be the answers that you should give? And on the other hand is, what if it is an unexpected ratio? So let's say you've done a test to see if they are different and then how to explain that. So first of all, we'll look at the expected ratio. Now, because here we'll talk about the inheritance of two genes and actually we'll be looking at the dihybrid uh, inheritance and actually the expected ratio for a dihybrid inheritance will be nine to three to three to one. And like I said, that would be the dihybrid inheritance. So we'll look at the hyper inheritance first. Now I have uh, made another video going into this particular one in a lot more detail uh, using the P example by Mendel. Uh, but basically, when we talk about dihybrid inheritance, we're talking about the inheritance of two genes on different chromosomes. So for example, if I've got gene A here on this particular chromosome, then I've got gene B on the other chromosome. And we say that they are inherited as separate units. So this is dihybrid inheritance. If you want to go into this in a lot more detail, then please feel free to check out the other video uh, that I've made. I'll put the link in the description below. Now, the, the more interesting question, however, will be when actually you got an unexpected ratio. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So usually the way that it progresses is that the question will first ask you to do a Punnett square to find what is the expected ratio uh, and maybe do some uh, a bit of calculation on that. So I'm saying the number of individuals with this particular characteristic and then try to, you can just use it as a percentage way to find out what the numbers would be. But then the second part, let's say type, uh, part B of the question will be okay, saying that actually, however, the observed phenotypic ratio is does not fit with the expected ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Then they will ask you to say, can you find out if they are actually different, if the difference is significantly enough to say that, okay, the ratio is unexpected. So in this particular case, then it will you will need to calculate the size of the difference between the two. And the way to do that is by doing a chi-squared test. So a chi-squared test is a statistical test that allows us to see if there is significant difference between the observed and expected uh, ratios. So usually we do this in terms of uh, looking at the number of uh, the phenotype in the observed version and the expected version, and then use the uh, this equation to calculate them. And, you, and usually in this sense, in the, in the question, they will give you a table listing out O and E and then all those calculations to help you in that process of calculating the chi-squared value. And then uh, same as all of the other stats tests is we compare it with the critical value at P equals uh, 0.05, which is about the 5% probability. For more information, check out that maths video that I've made previously. So basically the idea is if we compare it and it's like we say that the chi-square value is smaller than the critical value, then we would say that there is no significant difference between the two values. So we say uh, that actually the observed, diff uh, the observed uh, uh, ratio is the same as the expected ratio, meaning, okay, this is a dihybrid inheritance. However, the more interesting thing is if the chi squared value is bigger than the critical value, then we say, yes, there is significant difference between the two. That means uh, there is something else that has caused the observed, ratio, uh, the observed ratio to be different. And then the question that follows from this question, let's say part B, in part C will be saying, okay, can you explain why there is a significant difference? And usually it's down to two things. If your observed ratio is significantly different from the expected ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, then it's either going to be due to autosomal linkage or epistasis. So I'll look at autosomal linkage first. 
So in autosomal linkage, uh, it's important to know what the word means. So you might have come across sex linkage in the monogenic inheritance bit when we say that a gene is found on the sex chromosome X. Whereas autosomal linkage is a bit, a little bit more generous, another type of linkage essentially, and it's found on autosomes, which are what we call chromosomes that are the non-sex chromosomes. So essentially from chromosome number 1 to 22, those are all autosomes. So if two genes are found on the same chromosome, then we call it autosomal linkage. So for example, in this case, would be we would found gene A here and gene B on the same chromosome. So in comparison to the hybrid inheritance, when gene A and B are found on separate chromosomes, autosomal linkage, both genes are found on the same chromosome. And we say that the closer those two genes are, the less likely crossing over would occur. So meaning that there's a much higher chance of both of these genes being inherited as one unit. So actually, it, they would turn out to behave more like a monogenic inheritance rather than the hybrid inheritance. Now, actually, autosomal linkage can occur slightly differently depending on the gene loci, which is the location of the two genes on the same chromosome. So let's have a look at this one here. So imagine as if both of the genes are very, very close to each other and they pair up with their homologous chromosome. Uh, so this chromosome would have both genes as dominant and this one as both genes with recessive. This is just so that we can visualize this a little bit better. So when they do undergo meiosis 1, where uh, crossing over would normally occur because these two genes are much closer together so therefore it's harder or at least there's a lower probability for crossing over to occur between them or, and to see the effect. So basically and when they go into meiosis 2, the gene, when the chromosomes and the chromatids really are separated then we will get four separate chromosomes that looks a bit like this. In this case, you will see that for the four uh, offspring, the resulting offspring, we would get uh, big A, big B together and small a and small b together with a ratio 1 to 1. So you essentially will only get two particular phenotypes. Whereas in, uh, in the case of another case of autosomal linkage, when the two genes are slightly further apart, so that means there is a slightly higher chance for the crossing over to occur separating some of the uh, alleles and mixing those alleles up. So therefore, in this case, imagine if there's only one chiasmata being formed, we will get the resulting uh, chromatids like this. And so it will look a bit like this. And actually, if we look into this a little bit more detail, you would notice that the uh, genotype combination has already changed. So it would have big A, let's, uh, big A, big B, big A, little b, small a, big B, and small a, small b. So you would then suddenly get a lot more different combinations, all again one to one to one to one. So this time actually we would say that these ones here that have been mixed up so that the gene, the resulting genotype is different from the original parent genotype. We call them the recombinant uh, offspring. Just the keyword that you need to be aware of when it comes to autosomal linkage, really. So essentially the concept is uh, both of them are autosomal linkage, but the difference there is about how close the genes would be. So it's important to be aware that, for example, here, if the genes are closer together, they would behave more like monogenic inheritance because chromosome, uh, crossing over is less likely to occur. So the effects of autosomal linkage essentially would be more obvious. Whereas in the, another case of autosomal linkage, when the gene loci are further apart, that would mean that there's a high chance for crossing over and that would result in a different ratio here and different phenotypic ratio and actually um, that would be a lot more complicated in this sense. And actually in exams, you will not be expected to find out the phenotypic ratios of autosomal linkage because essentially there are loads of different combinations. Here I've only shown the possible combination of one particular crossing over. Whereas in reality, you, as obviously you might know, there are loads of genes on a chromosome. That means that there is no way of predicting how they might mix up. So you will not be expected to find out the phenotypic ratio uh, in autosomal linkage, but what that, this tells us is that this will help us uh, inf inform us of what is possibly going on in the chromosome when we look at the phenotypic ratio. So this is just a little bit more detail about autosomal linkage. Now, like I said, apart from autosomal linkage, there is another possible reason to explain for the unexpected ratio, which is epistasis. 
So epistasis is talk about the uh, interaction of genes at different loci, and usually that implies that they're on different chromosomes. But the only thing that it stops it from being a dihyper inheritance, showing the expected ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, is because that genes are interacting with each other through different ways. So for example, um, an example would be, let's say, gene A on this chromosome would be expressed to produce a particular protein, like this, Let's just call it protein A. And the protein A might be an, uh, an activator protein that will then bind to gene B and cause it to be expressed. Or sometimes it might be an inhibitor protein and stops it from being expressed. So that's what we mean by the interaction of genes. So when, we, when it comes to this point, uh, we can actually think of two specific types of epistasis. So here we could call it a dominant uh, epistasis or recessive epistasis, and it very much depends on uh, what is the uh, allele combination that causes the effect. So for example, in a dominant epistasis, uh, in the case of gene A and protein A, if we say that uh, a homozygous dominant combination or a heterozygous combination would have caused the effect, then we call it a dominant epistasis. For example, if protein A is a uh, activator protein, meaning without the expression of gene A, then gene B wouldn't be expressed, then that is a case of dominant epistasis, right? Because it relies on the um, dominant nature of that gene or allele to produce protein A to express gene B. Or alternatively, uh, recessive epistasis is when you've got a homozygous do uh, recessive combination that causes the effect. So recessive epistasis is, let's say, following the same example, uh, protein A is an activator, but then uh, both of the alleles for gene A are recessive. That means protein A wasn't produced. That means gene B wasn't actually expressed. Then that is an example of recessive epistasis. So it very much depends on what the scenario might be. Just remember, it's important to think about dominant and recessive epistasis in terms of what the precursor gene uh, uh, allele combination would be, not based on what is the result. Because a lot of people think, oh, dominant epistasis means that you've got a dominant result. Recessive epistasis means you get a recessive result. That's not necessarily the case. Make sure you look at the uh, allele combination of the original gene, the precursor gene, to make that decision. So to sum up, uh, this video is all about phenotypic ratios of inheritance of two genes. Um, if we think about it as in terms of question, the first part would be saying, okay, uh, what would be the expected ratio if they given a particular scenario? And then you can do, uh, a p based on dihybrid inheritance, you might expect it to be a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Keeping in mind dihybrid inheritance is talk about two genes on different chromosomes when they're inherited as separate units. However, then the question might ask, okay, but the observed ratio it's, seems to be this one. Can you evaluate and see if the observed ratio is the same as the expected ratio? Then you can do a chi-square test to find out if there is significant difference between the observed and uh, expected phenotypic ratios. Then let's say if at the end of that you would notice, okay, there is a significant difference between them, meaning the observed result is different from the expected one, then you would try to explain why that is the case, and the part three would be saying it might be due to autosomal linkage or epistasis. Keeping in mind that the question is very, very unlikely to ask you to uh, predict what the, ratio, the resulting ratios might be because, like we said in autosomal linkage, there, is low, there are loads of pos different possibilities, um, especially when we don't know where the gene loci might be. And as you notice that if, depending on the, the, the location or the separation of the two genes on the same chromosome, you may result in loads of different possible uh, phenotypic ratios as well. And this is the phenotypic ratios of inheritance of 2G.